wave particle duality. It's a nice equation that we'll talk about in a couple minutes. So, wave particle duality, what's our goal? To talk about it, and specifically about things that we normally think of as particles acting like waves. So we have kind of seen the opposite of that, light exhibiting both wave-like behavior and particle-like behavior, depending on the situation. So we've got some experiments, such as the double slit or thin film interference, that can be ex explained in terms of light acting as a wave. On the other hand, we have other experiments, the photoelectric effect and others, such as the Compton effect, that can be explained in terms of light acting as a particle. So sometimes light acts like a wave, sometimes it acts like a particle. So the particles of light are uh, known as photons, and photons are a little bit odd because uh, they have no mass, and yet they still carry momentum. So we can't use the uh, P equals MV equation that we used uh, just, you know, for a, a block or a ball or whatever, or a car, because the mass is not uh, finite, right? It's, it's a zero value. So it turns out we use a different equation for the momentum of a photon, uh, which is P is E over C. So you divide the energy divided by C and you get the momentum. Okay, and that part of the equation only works for photons. Okay, it doesn't work for things that have mass. So E you can write as HF, so you can write the momentum as HF over C, and F is C over the wavelength, so the factors of C can cancel out and you're left with a wavelength underneath. So you can then write it as momentum is H, Planck's constant, over the wavelength. Okay, so that's light, that's photons. So, again, Momentum of a photon is given by P is H over lambda. And then in 1923, Louis de Broglie came along and he said, now wait a second, maybe it goes the other way too. So he made a prediction that objects we usually think of as particles, like electrons, neutrons, things like that, they should also exhibit a wave-like nature. And their wavelength is simply rearrange that equation above lambda is h over p, and now, because there, these are things with mass that we're talking about, we can write the momentum as uh, mv. So you can write this de Broglie wavelength for things we typically think of as particles as h over mv. All right, so what does it mean? Well, the wave properties of matter, things that have mass, are only observable for very small objects. So, for instance, the de Broglie wavelength of U running at top speed is something like 10 to the minus 36 meters. Well, you know, we got no way to measure something with a wavelength that small. On the other hand, you have something tiny, an electron with a, you know, fairly modest energy. You just accelerate it through a potential difference of 10 volts, so it's got an energy of 10 electron volts. Then it turns out that the de Broglie wavelength is 3.9 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And, you know, 3.9 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, that's 3.9 angstroms, that's comparable to the spacing between atoms. And so a crystal, a regular array of atoms, can act as a diffraction grating for electrons. So that's kind of interesting. So, do we have any examples of particles showing wave properties? Well, yes, we do. So, you can actually fire electrons at a double slit, and you can create an interference pattern on a screen much like the pattern we obtained with light. It's kind of amazing. And what this means is, in some way, the and you can do it like one electron at a time and make this pattern. Um, so in some sense, the electron kind of goes through both slits at once and interferes with itself and makes this pattern. It's kind of weird. What else we got? Well, Again, with light, we can use X-ray diffraction use, and use it to study crystals, but you can also do the same thing with electrons or neutrons or atoms of hydrogen and helium. Again, we're only doing this for very, very small things. Okay, other examples? Wow, that's an interesting picture. 
So you th might think that was taken with a regular old microscope, but it certainly wasn't. So in a light microscope, uh, you're really limited by the wavelength of light. So we're talking about uh, the wavelength of visible light, the smallest value we've got is about 400 nanometers. And so that really limits us to uh, features of about that size. What we're seeing here on the head of this ant, courtesy of the U.S. Geological Survey, are features that are much, much finer than that. And this is taken with an electron microscope. And so uh, you can actually tune the energy of your electrons so that they have very, very small wavelengths. Typically, you know, you can get a thousand times smaller than the wavelength of visible light. And so you can study these very, very fine details. Okay, so here's another one. And this is uh, courtesy of, uh, UMA of uh, Dartmouth University. I think I said that on the previous screen somewhere, is it? No, it doesn't. Anyway, it comes from Dartmouth. And uh, it's an image of pollen taken with an electron microscope. Um, and again, we're just sort of using the wave features of electrons to build up this image. But you can really see, when you see these features, why many of us are so sensitive uh, in the springtime to these things of pollen, because, you know, they look so horrible. They get in your eyes and your nose, and when are you going to have a reaction to that? All right, so that's our introduction to wave particle duality.